voice. Okay. So I think uh, audio and video are clear, Madam Bhagavati. Audio is clear, video is clear. Yeah. So, like every Saturday, even today also, we will discuss few issues. And I will end the class at 8.15 or 8.17. See, you know, Uttar Pradesh, now it is a hot topic because for the constitutive term, Yogi Aitanath won the election and he will become the chief minister. It is a, a history since 37 years. Okay? Yeah. So, what he is doing, he is changing uh, all uh, the names. Generally, uh, I mean, with fear of Muslim origin into Hindu. Of course, now, uh, I, mean, I mean, this case will not come under that category. He has changed the Jansi railway station into Virangana Lakshmi Bai railway station. Just because Jansi is the place, okay? And Jansi became popular because of Jansi Lakshmi Bai. Okay? Yeah to honor the great personality of India, the railway station was renamed. So, you know, John C. Lakshmi Bai played a key role in the Sipai Mutsini. Okay? And even the soldiers of Sindhya will also support John C. because Sindhya supported the British in suppressing the revolt. Okay? And you know, even the British Army commanders praised the bravery of Jansi Lakshmi Bai. Okay, and when you come, when you go into the history of uh, uh, this kingdom, actually, when uh, I mean when they were not having the male issue, Dalhousie will not uh, accept uh, the adopted son, and by using the doctrine of lap, Dalhousie will occupy the Jansi. And you know. British occupied Indian territories in the name of Doctrine of Lap, again in the name of Subsidiary Alliance. You know, Subsidiary Alliance was uh, initiated in India in 1799 or 1800 by Lord Wellesley. If any princely state signs the Subsidiary Alliance, what happens? The British army will be stationed in that princely state. And for the maintenance of that army, the British used to uh, get some parts of the kingdom. Directly kingdom may be the revenue of the kingdom. Now, you know, the first person, the first princely state to sign the subject alliance in India is Nizam Ali Khan. Nizam Ali Khan, who was the Nawab of the Hyderabad. And he, he ceded Rail Sima districts, Rail Sima districts to the British, that is Madras government, honoring the subject alliance. Okay. So, whenever this princely state is fighting with another princely state, this sub alliance will army will support this princely state. But if both princely states are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, are having the sub alliance, then the sub alliance will not, uh, I mean, the, the sub alliance army will not participate in the war. So, it's, I mean, you see how the British has looted the India. And even British looted India, uh, I mean, in the name of... Uh, Booties, bounties, and also, I mean, corruption. Take the example of uh, Mr. Clive. So, Clive will get the 24 Paragana Jagir from Mir Jafar when Mir Jafar was made as the puppet Nawab of the Bengal after the death of the Siraj Uddawla. Okay? And even they used Indian revenues to purchase the raw material in India, and that raw material was transported to their motherland. So, in many ways, British looted the country. Now, she was born on 19 November 1828 in Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh. Her father's name was Moropant, Moropant Tambe. Lakshmi Bai's childhood name was Manikarnika and was affectionately addressed as Manu. And even Ambedkar is also called as modern Manu 
but you have to remember very important thing. Ambedkar opposed the Manu Dharma Shastra. Ambedkar opposed the Dharma Shastra. Ambedkar opposed the Varnashrama Dharma mentioned in the 10th Mandala of Purushasutra. Okay? Yeah. Though he is called as the modern Manu. Okay. Here, he is also called as Manu. She had a son, Damodar Rao. Actually, this uh, boy will die at early age. And uh, they were not allowed to adopt another boy. Okay? Who died within four months of his birth. Following the death of the infant, her husband adopted a cousin's child, Anand Rao, who was renamed Damodar Rao, a day prior to the death of the Maharaja. So next day, Maharaja will also die. When Maharaja died, uh, I mean, doc, um, this British will use the doctrine of lapse. They will not allow the uh, allow Jansi to, I mean, I mean Jansi Lakshmi Bhai to adopt this boy, Anand Rao, of course, who was renamed as the Damodar Rao. And you know, role in India's struggle for independence. So actually, as she lost her territory, she fought against the British to regain her territory. Okay. Rani Lakshmi Bai was one of the brave warriors of India's struggle for independence. See, actually, India's struggle for independence. So actually, we are talking about the Sipahi Mutini. Only few people call it as the first war of independence, like V.D. Savarkar. So many people say that no, no, every Every person was fighting for their selfish end, like Jansi Lakshmi Bai for her Jansi kingdom and Begum Hajrat Mahal for uh, her uh, I mean kingdom, Avad, and Nana Sahib uh, for his Peshwa Sip of this uh, I mean Maratha province. Okay? And Bahadur Shah too, to I mean re-establish the I mean Muslim Empire. Okay? Yes. Though though they were though they were struggling for their I mean selfish end, uh, of course. I mean, you can term them as the uh, term them as the freedom fighters. In 1853, when the Maharaja of Jansi died, Lord Dalhousie refused to acknowledge the child, child, and applied the doctrine of lapse and annexed the state. So, by using this doctrine of lapse, Dalhousie will occupy many territories. Okay, Rani Lakshmi Bai fought bravely against the British, so as to save her empire from annexation. She died fighting on the battlefield on 17th June 1858. When the Indian National Army started its first female unit in 1943, you know, the first female unit was named as the, named after the valiant queen of Jansi, Jansi Regiment. Indian National Army started by Raj Bihari Bose, Captain Mohan Singh, of course, led by Subhash Chandra Bose in particular. Okay? Yes. Now, now doctrine of lapse. It was an annexation policy. Followed widely by Lord Dalhousie when he was India's Governor General from 1848 to 56. Of course, he is uh, he earned the bad name for this doctrine of lapse. If you set aside this doctrine of lapse, Lord Dalhousie is known for many developmental activities. In his period only, public works department was uh, started. So, though, though they have started, I mean, railways and roadways, etc., for their selfish end, but even they supported in course of time Indians, and uh, it is one of the major cause for the I mean rise of national consciousness among the Indians. Uh, I mean communication, roads, etc., etc. Okay, and uh, according to this, any princely state that was under the direct or indirect control of the East India Company, where the ruler did not have a legal male heir, would be annexed by the company. So it actually it is wrong because Hindu shastras will accept the adopted son as the heir, all Hindu Shastras, but these people wanted to occupy Indian territories by some or other protection. See, take the example of Avad. Avad was occupied in the name of Misro and that Nawab was ruling the territory in a fair manner. Of course, at least better than the British, there is no doubt in it. Okay? Yeah. Thus, any adopted son of the Indian ruler would not be proclaimed as heir. Heir means successor to the kingdom. By applying the doctrine of lapse, Dalhousie annexed the states of Satara. So this order was asked once in the UPSC prelims. Order of the kingdoms annexed by Dalhousie in the name of doctrine of lapse. Okay. Satara. If it is if it is any wrong, you try to correct it. I think it is correct. Jaitapur and some Jaitapur and Sambalpur, 1849. 
and Bhagat 1850, Udaipur 52, Jansi 53, Nagpur. Okay. Now, so actually nowadays you have to remember what is the procedure. So actually, uh, the state government should pass a, I mean, resolution in the state legislative assembly, and it should forward to the railway ministry. And with the consent of home, home ministry, the name will be changed. Okay, and even uh, I mean the railways will change its code, etc., etc. An executive order passed with simple majority by the state legislature is required to rename any village, town, city, or a station where an amendment of the constitution with majority in parliament is needed for changing the name of a state. To change the name of a state, a constitutional amendment is needed. But you have to remember to change the name of a state for the formation of the new state, alteration of boundaries. Then this amendment is not by Article 368. That is very important. Formation of the new states and uh, the changing the name of the state or altering the boundaries, etc., will not, though it is a constitutional amendment, it will not come under Article 368. That is very important. It is by a simple majority of the parliament. Okay. It is done by the Article 3 of the Constitution. Article 3 of the Constitution. Okay. Now, it is noteworthy that the Union Home Ministry gives a green signal to the proposal to change the name of any railway station or place after getting no objection from the Ministry of Railways, Department of Post, and Survey of India. So, they will take the NOCs from three departments and Home Ministry will give the clearance. And even he said that, Yogi Aitanath said that, I am going, we are going to change many such names which were changed earlier without any reason. Okay? Yes, this is with regard to Rani, I mean Lakshmi Bai. Okay. See, in recent days, Sweet revolution is in the news. Sweet revolution. What is sweet revolution? Because you know sweet. Every day, of course, everybody's life will start with sweet. Why? If you drink milk, you need sugar. If you drink tea, you need sugar. If you drink coffee, you need sugar. Even green tea also, you will put the honey. It is also sweetened. And uh, what is sweet revolution? So, many people are in this class, so only one person is able to answer. This is how you are going to the paper. See, 90% you have to do, 10% we will do. Of course, we will, and of course, we will do everything in our routine classes, but still you have to cover many things. You will cover, but you will not recover. That is the problem. Anybody in this uh, live session, what what is sweet revolution? It pertains to which item? Many people are UPSC, I mean aspirant. Many of them are seniors, already attempted exam uh, once or twice. Okay. So, seed revolution is related to the apiculture. Apiculture is the rearing of honeybees. Honey is highly nutritious substance and it will boost immunity like anything. And the COVID-19 has encouraged the people to, I mean, switch over to all such kind of good food items. Okay. And even when you come to the beekeeping or apiculture, it will also provide employment opportunity. One side. Other side, encouragement for the indigenous and village industry. Okay, and it is a uh, gift of nature to the mankind, honey. And you know how honey, we will uh, make the honey. So it will collect the nectar from all the flowers and it will secrete in a, um, a bread like uh, mesh, which is also prepared by it. And every item is having uh, the commercial value. Every item of that honeybee is having the commercial value. So now what happened? That honey has to be processed. At least, of course, it will have a lot of shelf life, but some sort of impurities have to be removed. So now what happened? These uh, petty farmers are the 
beekeepers are forced to carry all that raw honey to the I mean nearby processing center. So it is a cumbersome process. Many villages are not connected by road and even to and fro charges etc. Now the government has initiated the mobile processing units. The van will come to the uh, that house and where that honey is processed and even all the byproducts of honeybee are having lot of commercial value. Okay, and you know, maybe last year, an international agency has checked the quality of the honey in India. So it said that, uh, I think if I am not wrong, I mean excluding uh, Safola, all other honey are uh, not up to the mark, including the Patanjali. Of course, it was revealed in the paper. Of course, the quality may change from time to time. Sometimes even the good brands may not pack because it is of nature, you may have some impurities. Of course. It is not our matter. Okay. So, and uh, you have to remember this that is, sweet revolution pertains to the apiculture, that is the honey. Okay. okay. The Kadi and Villa Industries Commission, KVIC, has launched the country's first mobile honey processing van at village in Uttar Pradesh. See, Kadi and Village Industries, it is a dream of the Mahatma Gandhi. So to encourage this, Gandhi strived a lot and uh, as we honored the Gandhian philosophy, this concept was already enshrined in our diet to principles of state policy. Okay. See, when you harness the raw materials of village in a fair manner, one thing, you will get the employment opportunities. And the second thing, the country will become self-sufficient. There is no need to import uh, everything from foreign countries. See, earlier, every person was using the jute bags, okay, jute bags for carrying vegetables or any other items. Now, what happened? Jute is replaced by other things like plastic and which are harmful to our health and also ecosystem. So, it, for, for this reason only, government is taking many steps to encourage the Kadian village industry. If uh, these village industries are having the sufficient employment opportunities, while the why the people will migrate to urban areas? If people migrate to urban areas, what happens? There will be development of slums, congestion. Now you can see traffic in Hyderabad, especially in front of our institution. In the evening, we will not be able to cross the road also. Why? Only Hyderabad in our state is able to provide the employment opportunities. To stop the migrations, the government of India in particular to take more and more such kind of steps, especially food processing industry is having uh, I mean lot of potential and opportunities in course of time yes it may be fruits I mean lot of thing, uh, things including the pickles which are having a shelf life of more than one year many things okay yeah mobile honey processing van that will process beekeepers honey at their doorstep and thus save them the hassle and cost of taking the honey to processing plant in far off cities for processing the to and fro charges and even if they want to take their honey to the processing uh, processing units i mean they require some i mean considerable uh, quantity so all persons may not uh, produce that uh, much of quantity even if this van comes even a small uh, i mean honey bee keeper will be able to process that okay that is very important so then the hassle and the cost of taking the honey to processing planet plants in far of the cities for processing. This initiative is taken in pursuance of sweet kranti, sweet revolution. Okay, and again, now, we are the major consumers of the sugar. And whenever the price of sugar increases, automatically such kind of things will substitute. So, to control the prices of the commodity, so definitely, there should be ample of substitution. If you take the example of vegetables, you are having many vegetables. Okay, if one vegetable is available at lesser, uh, I mean lesser price, automatically it will impact other, I mean just other vegetable prices also. Now this tomato and onion are cheap. Automatically all other vegetable prices are also little bit low, on it. not too low, but little bit low. If tomatoes were not available at 10 rupees or 12 rupees now, then all other all other vegetables might have been uh, uh, at the price of more than 100 rupees. Okay. So the, it is the importance of substitute. Of course, of course, you cannot compare the price of sugar with the honey. But still, because you may take 
1 teaspoon of sugar but here you will consume only 1 drop of honey or 2 drops of honey in your green tea it is having lot of medicinal value since time immemorial it is used in the medicine plant especially the ayurvedic powder earlier consumed along with the uh, honey or ghee of course now um, we left everything and we are running behind the western medicine of course it is having its own pros and cons ayurveda is having its own pros and cons i mean you cannot say that western medicine is best you cannot say that ayurvedic is best everything are is having its pros and cons yes now key points benefits of mobile honey processing van the transportation of honey to processing plants is an expensive affair for small farmers and beekeepers because every farmer will not have so much of uh, i mean uh, quantity see a person who is having 1 liter of milk uh, will not come to hyderabad in bus and sell, sell it because his traveling charges will be far uh, beyond the 1 liter of milk uh, rate okay to avoid high transportation and processing costs a majority of beekeepers would sell their raw honey to the agents at their farms themselves at a very low price when they are not having the processing uh, i mean units or when they are not having the time to go or when when it is not feasible what they are doing now they are selling to the middleman at a lesser price so when they sell the their commodity to the middleman at uh, i mean lesser price automatically they will not get the profit when they gets the see when they get the less profits they will get discouraged to uh, continue this business so now the farmers will be encouraged because their profits will be increased the processing van will reduce the honey extraction and processing cost to be amid to the beekeepers this will also eliminate any scope for adulteration of honey as the processing will be done at the doorsteps of the beekeepers and the farmers so at, uh, i mean at that place no question of any uh, i mean uh, i mean this adulteration who knows after uh, the farmer Uh, i mean preparing the honey i mean after processing he may mix with i mean it with the sugar solution or even the jaggery solution who knows okay yeah about sweet revolution it is an ambitious initiative of the government of india for promoting apiculture what is apiculture bee keeping so popularly known as the bee keeping to provide a booster shot to sweet revolution the government launched the national bee keeping and honey mission in 2020 under the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare so you have to remember which program is under which ministry or which organization is working under which ministry especially for upsc prelims and group 1 prelims you will get such kind of questions of course you are having n number of ministries and you know india is gifted with n number of uh, i mean programs and but you are not having any other way to study it aims to accelerate the production of quality honey and other related products just now i told you other products related to honey are also having lot of commercial value okay the demand for good quality honey has grown over the years as it is considered a naturally nutritious product if you put two drops of honey on your tongue maybe within very hardly one or two minutes that sucrose will enter into your blood and it will give you the instant energy see you can see the sports persons they will consume the glucose powder why to get the instant energy so this honey will also give them the instant energy other apiculture products such as royal jelly bees wax pollen etc all are having the commercial value okay are also used extensively in different sectors like pharmaceuticals food beverage beauty beauty means cosmetics and even honey itself is also applied by few people along with the i mean turmeric and okay to see that their skin will glow okay yes under the honey mission the, the kadi village industries corporation provides the farmers or beekeepers practical training about the examination of honey bee colonies means whether they are mature when you have to extract the honey if you delay the process honey bee itself will eat the all the honey the idea behind secreting that honey is to consume that by the honey bee in course of shortages its idea is to consume by itself but what you are doing we are consuming so before that you will extract the honey and if you delay the process automatically honey will clean all the honey identification and management of bee enemies 
and DZS along with the management of bee colonies in all season, acquittance with apicultural equipments and honey extraction and wax purification. For that wax, I mean, which is like uh, the bread, between that only you will have the honey. So even that uh, wax is also having a lot of um, commercial value. The honey mission program was launched by KVIC during 2017-18. Technology intervention through this mission will ensure bee conservation, prevent disease, disease or the loss of the bee colonies and provide quality and quantity of agriculture products. Yes, uh, even we have to minimize the loss of bee colonies because they may die because of many diseases, who knows. So they will involve in R&D works and they will see that they will have a healthy growth also. And even, I mean, in the nearby area, so they have to have the, I mean, flowering plants. All, I mean, these kind of things are guided by the government authorities. So, see, these kind of things will encourage the self-employment opportunities because government cannot provide everybody with a government job. Understand? Yeah. Farming practices will yield superior quality honey and other products for the domestic as well as international market. So, if you export for foreign countries, you will earn a lot of foreign exchange. Okay? Yeah. Beekeeping is a low investment and highly skilled enterprise model in which technology application has emerged as a great enabler for socio-economic growth. See, if the condition of the farmer increase, uh, I mean, uh, elevates economically, automatically he will occupy a better position in the social ladder. And even his success, they will get the good education automatically. I mean, uh, I mean, they will also lead a happy life. And so, for socioeconomic growth, these kinds of things are very important. And even they will create a lot of uh, employment opportunities directly or indirectly. And because government cannot provide everybody with the government jobs. Scaling up beekeeping will double farmers' income because I mean, doubling farmer's income is our uh, Indian government's motto. So, if uh, farmer is encouraged to involve in all kinds of such allied activities like beekeeping, dairy farming, cattle rearing, fishery culture, even nowadays, even farmers are also selling the vermi compost and also horticulture. Okay? But the thing is, the main problem is the problem with the marketing. The problem with the marketing and the money is made by the middleman rather than the farmer. Farmer is selling the commodity at a lesser price. Consumer is purchasing the commodity at a higher price. But who are making the money? Middleman. The government should make a plan such that the items are transferred directly to the consumers. Avoiding this middleman. Of course, that is having its own I mean, pros and cons. As the uh, government made a farm law. Uh, by putting an end to the Monday system, that is uh, the middleman. So the farmer can now go to directly DMART or Reliance Mart and they can sell their commodities. So they thought that will happen in that manner. But what happens if, uh, uh, it's actually in the Monday system, there will be an optioning process. So farmer may get better price. So here private person may try to exploit the farmer. Of course, that is also true. In the Monday system, there is an auction process. Here, a single farmer will go and even it is very tough for a small farmer because India is having the small land holdings. Every farmer is small. He cannot all the way carry two or three bags to the DMART or Reliance. So, Monday system should be there, but the government should look at this, I mean, new system such that the price gap between the farmer and the consumer will be minimum. Now, it is maximum. Farmer is selling papaya at his farm at 10 rupees kg. But the consumer is purchasing at 45 50 rupees kg. Take the example of tender coconut. Very hardly the farmer will sell at 15 rupees or 20 rupees. Even I think it, I mean it may be less than that. In Hyderabad now the I mean tender coconut is 50 rupees. Who are making the money? Middleman. Farmer is not happy. Consumers are also not happy. With great difficulty they are drinking 50 rupees of tender coconut. Okay? Yes, my dear. Now, ensure food security and bee conservation and increase crop productivity. Kadi and Village Industries Commission, KVIC is a statutory body. See, you may get in the examination. KVIC is a advisory body, statutory body, non-statutory body. KVIC is a statutory body established under the Kadi and Village Industries Commission Act 1956. The KVIC is 
started with the planning, promotion, organization, and implementation of programs for the development of Kadi and other village industries in the rural areas in coordination with other agencies engaged in rural development wherever necessary. See, of course, just now I told you, the, I mean, the, uh, I mean, available raw material in the villages should be processed there itself. They should be converted into a finished product. Then farmers will get more income. And the next thing is, you can replace many imports by indigenous goods. See, we people will purchase the cloths from outside. Pepe jeans, couchons, definitely they are not of Indian origin. Okay? Why we are not encouraging the Kadi, Kadi of Indian origin, Kadi cloth? It is excellent. Okay? We are purchasing Pepe jeans and couchons for thousands of rupees, whereas Indian cotton is available at I mean lesser price. Of course, it is less durable. You purchase three or four pets, and even it is good for health also. There are many things which can be manufactured in the villages, like fruit jelly, squash, okay, and pickles, and many more items. Okay, okay. Now, what is the meaning of the statutory body? That is very important. Statutory body. What is meant by statutory organization? Any body which is established by the act of parliament is called as a statutory body. That is very, very important. You have to remember that. If any body is formed, if any body or, or organization is established by an executive resolution, by an executive resolution, it is called as non-statutory body. Like planning commission in the earlier days. By only executive resolution. Okay, even CBI also non-statutory body, Central, Central Bureau investigation. Okay, that non-statutory, though it is a non-statutory body, it is having lot of value. It works under the Home Ministry, that is CBI. Okay, yes. Now, the KVIC, ticket, it functions in the Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises. This is also very important. KVIC works under Ministry of Micro, small and medium enterprises just i will show the show you the byproducts Byproducts of the apiculture. Okay. Rearing and management of honey bees for commercial production of honey and other products of the beehive is called apiculture. The products obtained from apiculture are honey, beeswax, honeydew, bee bread, and propolis are bee glue, royal jelly, bee venom, or apitoxin. All are having the commercial value. Of course, I cannot. Uh, spend time for this each thing you, you go through in the wikipedia everything is having the commercial value everything widely used in cosmetics pharmaceuticals etc so what i mean to say is you should harness the product up to the optimum level then only the i mean uh, profits of that farmer will increase why amul is having lot of profit it is having lots of uh, uh, members in its society because of the value addition Milk, cheese, curd, everything. Okay? Okay. See, see, recently, one Kathak dancer died. What is the name of that Kathak dancer? Because I told you yesterday's history class, how you will get questions from this classical dances or folk dances or classical music or folk music. I told you yesterday also, day before yesterday also. In our regular classes. Any aspirant, UPSC aspirant, all our aspirants. Of course, it is difficult for you to go through the I mean current affairs. Daily, daily you will get uh, 10 or 20 PDFs of current affairs. Minimum 10 PDFs. Even you can see our institute's current affairs magazine, awards, economics, and every day. So there will be some day. Every day you will have some day. 365 days, some are overlapping. How many days you will remember? If you remember all those, you will lose your 
own name and you will not reveal your name. You will forget your birthday also. Anybody? So, it is how, I mean, you will study. At least you segregate the current affairs. Don't study everything blindly because it is ocean. You cannot swim all over the ocean from top to bottom and the total surface area. Not possible for you, not possible for me, not possible for anybody else. Okay? Yes. Now, recently the famous Kathak dancer, Pandit Munna Shukla died. So, in your examination you will get, Pandit Munna Shukla is a dancer, a musician, a painter, a eminent economist. Okay, okay, no issue. So, you know, Kathak is a... I know, okay. Of course, even Birju Maharaj also passed away, it seems, and we will also deal, with, uh, I mean, with regard to Birju Maharaj in the coming weekend. Okay? Okay. Madam Pranathiriti Garu, thank you. Okay. 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 Now, you know, Kathak is the classical dance of the Uttar Pradesh. It has originated from the traditional storytellers. From the traditional storytellers. And Birju Maharaj is also proficient in that. And uh, he also passed away, it seems, in the recent days. Okay. We will deal with, uh, I mean, with regard to him in the coming class. Now, Kathak dancer Pandit Munna Shukla died. His most noted works include the dance drama Shane Mughal, Inder Sabha, Amir Kusro. And you know, Amir Kusro is, is proficient in tabla and sitar. He is considered to be the inventor of tabla and sitar. He was given title Totaye Hind by Alauddin Khilji, Amir Kutro. And he is the person who has uh, initiated the Hindustani music, of course, popularized in the period of Mughal by Tantan and many more people. Okay? And he was a Persian poet, and uh, time and again he used Hindi and Urdu words in his Persian poetry. Okay? Yeah. And he wrote the Alauddin Khilji's biography, Tarike Allah or Kazain Ulukutu. You remember that. Okay? And even he wrote Tughlaq Nama, which is the biography of Gyasuddin Tughlaq, not Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Okay? Okay. Anga Mukti, Anvesha, Bahar, Ratak, Raujbad, Duni, among others. So try to remember at least three one day. Because he, he may have I'm proficient in more than 100. Yeah, 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 yeah. The importance of Amir Kushru is in that book, Tari Ke Allah, he first mentioned about the Johar in the Indian history. What is Johar? When the Rajput queens will jump into the fire and commit suicide. And that Johar of Rani Padmavati was mentioned by Amir Kushru. Of course, there is a movie, Rani Padmavati, which became a lot of controversial. Uh, so, before its release. And Rani Padmavati, uh, Book is written by J.C. Muhammad, who was the court poet of uh, the later ruler Sher Shah Suri. And it is also considered to be the first Hindi book. But it is not first Hindi book because even you are having Chand Bardais, I mean Prithviraj Raso. Okay? Okay. Now, his contribution to the world of dance was awarded the Sangeet Natak Academy Award, 2006. Saitya Kala Parishad Award. And the Saraswati Saman. Now, who will give the classical dance status in India? Which organization is responsible for giving a dance the status of a classical dance? That is also very important. So, nobody is able to answer. Yes, 
check it so it may be sangeet natak academy no doubt in it so sangeet natak academy will give the status of classical dance to the dance that you remember okay such kind of question you know that india is having eight types of classical dances everything but this organization is important even ministry of culture has recognized sau as the classical dance but it was not recognized by sangeet natak academy sau is a folk folk dance of the bihar bihar and jharkhand it is a mask dance okay theek hai now his contribution to the world of dance was over at the sangeet natak academy about 2006 sai takla parishad and the saraswati samman 2011 now so actually when you come to the kathak the art of storytelling kathak is one of the eight forms of classical indian dance hailing from northern india this dance originally focused on religious theme before it was adapted for the mogal court during the 16th century performed by courtesans these themes were replaced with popular and secular folk stories to entertain the aristocracy earlier only a religious theme in course of time folk stories to entertain the nobles and aristocracies even kings in the mogal court not only mogal court by the side of mogal courts there were many prince i mean few dotries petty kings all patterned this art of kathak earlier religious theme in course of time folk stories yes now facial movements were a key part of the kathak dance and prominent makeup was worn by dancers to highlight their expression see they used to reveal the story with their expression then persian influence kathak became heavily influenced by persian dance and music during the mogal empire and this included the costumes that were worn so in the prelims they may ask various statements with regard to the kathak dance it is having persian influence if you know you will understand that if not nothing else because mogal courts itself is is introduced is is influenced by the persian and which delhi sultan initiated persian court system in india which delhi sultan initiated persian court system in india and he started celebrating the persian new year nowruz online students bhagwati swati only two students of course offline there are many in front of me yes he is balban and balban very important question balban will introduce the persian court system in india which continued for a long period even english east india company also followed the persian court system and also persian administration okay yes now okay so this is very important point which you can remember easily and ornate jewelry the mogal empire was known for its stunning jewelry take the example of peacock throne peacock throne which was fabricated in the period of uh, shah jahan it had emeralds rubies emeralds rubies diamonds see the all the constructions from the period of shah jahan were magnanimous and if you embed the gems and gems and jewels in the construction what type of uh, architecture that is called that is also very important gems and jewels in the construction rubies in the construction which was highly uh, made by the shah jahan what is that type of architecture called because you people are i mean aspirants even in the live even in the live also in front of me also n number of students are there it is how to revise the i mean uh, subjects yes one is correct bhagavati is correct it is the petrodora petrodora many times appeared in the examination and delhi sultanate arabic school delhi sultanate arabic school okay okay so the mogal empire was known for its stunning jewelry so it's no surprise that kathak dancers were adorned with it especially as jewelry helped to emphasize their movements 
they typically wore pieces such as earrings bracelets armlets necklaces and so on which were made from gold or occasionally silver see sometimes see as two proficient uh, kathak dancers uh, passed away this year even you may expect this question in the main also like 3 years ago they asked about the tandava nrutya in the main you know tandava nrutya but you have to write 150 words or 200 words you know kathak you know the name of birju maharaj but in depth you have to write so try to remember these facts also it will be useful for your mains also now eye catching costume dancers wore trousers under their sheer skirt known as churidar pajamas in bright colors such as orange and red which made them more noticeable not only did this hold the audience's attention but it enabled them to see the deliberate and skilled movements of the kathak dancers see if you see if you wore uh, this uh, uh, i mean what do you say in the english gajjalu maname tellu gajjalu antam anklets with the bells and anklets with some yes anklets which will have the sound so if you wear this then you can see his feet movement because you will get the sound and you will get the sound okay so please remember this okay now i mean percussive footwear gungrus yes gungrus of course gungrus is also not uh, not a english word and gungru is a hindi word so even these people also don't know english like me gungrus anklets of small yes metal bells strung, strung together were worn dancers to highlight their rapid foot movements okay yes and uh, it will have lot of rhythmic steps and so try to have command on these all points because definitely you will get this question in the main circle in now the word kathak has been derived from the word katha which means a story it is primarily performed in northern india it was primarily a temple or village performance wherein the dancers narrated stories from ancient scriptures it is one of the classical dances of india along with seven other and just now i told you earlier they had the religious themes in their dance now even they added the folk stories in course of the mogal empire to to entertain the courtians like you are having the item songs in the movies and to entertain you people then only you will go to the movie if not again you will come to the class okay theek hai now kathak began evolving into a distinct mode of dance in the 15th and 16th centuries with the spread of the bhakti movement of course not only 15th and 16th century bhakti movement started earlier even in the 6th century ad you are having the acharya rai ramanuja acharya madhava acharya and shankara acharya it is the uh, it is the bhakti mum uh, it, it is the bhakti movement in response to the islamic era you are having nana tukaram ramdas many people and okay the legends of radha krishna were enacted in folk plays called ras leela which combined folk dance with the basic gestures of the kathak storytellers okay of course ras leela is a folk dance under the mogal emperors and their nobles kathak was performed in the court while it acquired its present features and developed into a form of dance with a distinctive style so the present uh, approach or the model has its origin in the i mean mogal court and even i told about the amir khusro also under the patronage of wajid ali shah the last nawab of our it grew into a major art form so he is the ruler of the our he is the last ruler of the our in his period only in his period only british will occupy the our in the critics of mist rule it was not liked by the uh, i mean british soldiers most of whom were from the avar and the they will this british after occupying the avar will levy heavy taxes on the farm community and most of these soldiers were farmers it is one of the reasons for the sipai mutini and uh, the wife of uh, uh, sorry i mean the widow of wajid ali shah will participate in the sipai mutni begum hazrat mahal 
and you have to remember one king's name from the avar who is known for popularizing the lucknowi culture lucknowi culture anybody our students will come to classes daily you check it once again you check it, it is, I, if i am not wrong he is abdul daula ar asaf daula abdul daula ar asaf daula definitely there is no doubt in it just getting confused with the abdul daula ar asaf daula that's all okay yes lucknowi culture and even bara imembara is also credited to them a very nice art architectural masterpiece bara imembara yes abdul daula asaf daula is correct it seems and bhagwati chapter asaf uddaula please remember asaf uddaula because there are many uddaulas so it is how to set aside the confusion and when we discuss in the class yeah sir got confused and he told like this one it is correct so asaf uddaula is the prominent king of uh, the avadh who has popularized the lucknowi culture you don't know what sort of questions will come and you know the uh, I, i mean nawab of avadh who participated in the battle of buxar the nawab of avadh who participated in the battle of buxar online students shuja uddawla andi shuja uddawla okay theek hai theek hai theek hai theek hai now yes just uh, Yes, I am trying to recollect important uh, points of this uh, uh, our province only. That's all. Okay. Now, dance style. Usually, a solo performance, the dancer often pauses to recite verses, followed by their execution through movement, both reciting and execution. You can see a sample video of uh, Virju Maharaj. He will recite and also he will dance. The focus is more on footwork. Gungrus. They will play. footwork the movements are skillfully controlled and performed straight legged by dancers wearing ankle belts so ankle belts in in the gungru now the tatkar is the fundamental footwork footwork in the kathak so you try to remember tatkar is a term related to the kathak because only god knows what will appear in the civil services kathak is the only form of classical dance wedded to Hindustani or North Indian music, because we have just now discussed about the Amir Khosro, and it was patterned by Mughals. So it is very important point. It is how to add the, um, I mean, masala to the topic set. Kathak is the only form of classical dance wedded to Hindustani or North Indian music. Some prominent dancers include Birju Maharaj and Sitara Devi. Other classical dance in India, everybody know. because we have discussed this in the last two days classes bharatanatyam from tamil nadu kathakali from kerala kuchipudi from andhra pradesh odissi from odisha satriya from assam recently added classical dance and uh, manipuri and the and the profounder was on our i mean rabindranath tagore mohiniattam again from kerala okay now and you know about the bhakti movement that is The development of bhakti movement took place in Tamil Nadu between the 17th, 7th, and 9th centuries. In this period, Alvars and Nayanars, Alvars, Vaishnavites, Nayanars, Shaivites. It was reflected in the emotional poems of the Nayanars, devotees of Shiva, and Alvars, devotees of Vishnu. Just I want to revise these things. And these saints looked upon religion not as a cold formal worship. but as a loving bond based upon love between the worshiped and the worshipper that is god and the people okay yes of course in course of time the main idea was to put an end to the sectarian conflict even vaishnavites and shaivites used to fight like anything and upper caste hindus were not uh, mingling with the lower class people they were embracing other religion even to stop the 
I mean, lower class Hindus moving into other religion is also one objective of the Bhakti movement. They wrote in local languages, Tamil and Telugu, and were therefore able to reach out to many people. One of the important uh, uh, contribution of Bhakti saints is, of course, this was the recent UPSC main question. For the literature, that too, vernacular literature, local literature, local literature. They wrote in local languages, Tamil and Telugu, and were therefore able to reach out to many people. In course of time, the ideas of the South moved up to the North, but it, is, but it was a very slow process. So, Bhakti movement moved to North, but slowly. But you know, when you come to the first phase of Bhakti movement, that is Shankaracharya, who is, uh, who is considered to be the, uh, I mean, just initiator of the Bhakti movement. What is the idea of Shankaracharya? Aryanization. What is Aryanization or, or, or Sanskritization? It is nothing but the, the, I mean, the lower class people should inculcate the habits of the Aryans. That is hygienic habits. Then they can occupy the top position in the social ladder. Okay? Yes. A more effective method for spreading the Bhakti ideology was the use of local language. The Bhakti saints composed their verses in local languages. They also translated Sanskrit works to make them understandable to a wider audience. Examples include Nanadeva writing in Marathi, Kabir Surdas and Tulsidas in Hindi, Shankar Deva popularizing Assamese, which Shankar Deva is also responsible for the Vaisna dance that is Satriyandi. And Satram is the name of the religious monastery. Chaitanya and Chandida spreading their message in Bengali, Mirabai in Hindi and Rajasthani. And, uh, and this Mirabai was a, I mean, devotee of uh, Radha Krishna. And Mirabai is a daughter-in-law of a famous uh, Rajput ruler. Daughter-in-law of a famous Rajput ruler. Who is the Rajput ruler? Nobody from online? Yes, Rana Sangram Singh. Rana Sangram Singh. Or Rana Sangha. And the battle between the Rana Sangram Singh and Babar, where Babar, though he won the war, Babar praised the Babar praised the heroism of the Rana Sangram Singh in his uh, autobiography, Tuzike Baburi, which is in Taktai Turkish language. What is the name of the battle? Yes, Kanwa. Battle of Kanwa. Okay. After first battle of Panipat, you are having the battle of Kanwa. After battle of Kanwa, you are having the battle of Chenderi. After battle of Chenderi, you are having the battle of Dagar. And finally, Babar will die in 1530. Okay. Yes, my dears, we will meet for this class next week. And the second class will start at 9.45. Second class will start at 9.45. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.